Shalom Aleichem. I'm Rachel Schechter, editor of the Farvets. Welcome to Five Yiddish Comedians Walk Into a Zoom, part of our series, Forward Focus Talks in Trying Times, weekly talks with well-known personalities working to build community through this crisis. We're also offering all participants a special discount subscription to the Forward, six months for $10 and 67% off for first time subscribers. You'll get more info about that later on in the chat box. For those of you who don't know much about the Forwards, we're a website devoted to promoting Yiddish language and culture, both to those who don't know any Yiddish and those who do. In addition to our long running cooking show, Es Gesunde Hate with English subtitles, we now have a daily YouTube feature called Yiddish Word of the Day. Just subscribe to the Forward YouTube channel if you want to watch that. We also have a weekly yoga session in Yiddish with optional English subtitles and the very first digital Yiddish crossword platform in the world. Today we brought together five well-known performers of Yiddish humor, including High Wolf, Michael Wex, Shane Baker, Alan Lewis Rickman, and Yelena Schmulinson. I will introduce them all separately and ask each of them to give us a sample of what we mean by Yiddish humor, and then chat with each of them a bit about their background and how they came to perform Yiddish comedy. We'll start with High Wolf. High has been acting and singing on the stage, screen, television, commercials, and films for over 40 years, and appeared in the films A Stranger Among Us and Crossing Delancey. He is co-president of the Hebrew Actors Foundation, executive director of the Central Yiddish Culture Organization, and is working to remodel the Hebrew Actors Union building on East 7th Street in Manhattan into a Yiddish theater and cultural center for New York City. So hi, welcome. Welcome. Why don't you give our viewers an example of Yiddish humor? I wish I knew what it was. Well, we can discuss what Yiddish humor is later, but first let's see a sample of what it looks like. Uh, well, it, it takes many forms. It could be song, it could be uh, jokes, uh, you know. So you know, those, a song, uh, you know a song about a Litvak and a Galician. Oh, that's what you, oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, so that's a song that was written by Eli Bass, and it's the confusion of languages uh, from different dialects, from the North and the South. The intro I normally do to that song is the different dialects of Yiddish oftentimes did cause problems. For example, in the Russian Yiddish, the word to live or reside is to live in Yiddish is... Boinen. Boinen. Oh, okay. Uh, however, in the, uh, in the Russian dialect, the word is Vainen. So this disparity of dialects often led to misunderstandings in the street shop and the home, and the song sort of goes like specifically this. From my wife, I got such aggravation. She's driving me out from my bits. She's from a different denomination. I'm a Litvak and she's a Galitz. We're happily married. I don't put us quark. We understand each other completely, except when we talk. I say mutter, zoxi, mitter. Sis me bitter, zok, mutter, zoxi, pitter. What's the difference, mutter, mitter, pitter? Oh, how I schwitz, cause I'm a Litvak. And she's a gan I love my darlings, there is no one finer in Pinsko, Pinsko, even Carolina. But when I call her Shane is up, she shine as a modern Yiddish Redman got in China. So was Tegas, she says Toikis. Every time that I get Bregas, she gets Bregas. So was Tegas, Toikis, Bregas, Bregas, I'll call it Quits, because I'm a Litva. And she's a Gan, Yan, 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 Yan. I say, Gay, Zoxy Guy. I say, Stay, Zoxy Stay. I say, Oh, Zoxy, I, Oi, Bay, I, Bye, Bye. Why did I ever get mad? I say, Gros, Zoxy, Gros. I say, Bos, Zoxy, Boots. I say, Blow, Zoxy, Blues. I say, Do me a favor, as I'll put in the notes. And it goes on to, uh, and I'm a Litvak, a plain simple Litvak, and she, she, she snappers from another boil. Yes, she's a gan, yan, 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 yan. She's a Galitz. Boom. Thank you, Chaim. Sure. So tell, uh, us a bit, tell us a bit about your background, where you grew up, did you hear Yiddish at home, and where you went to school? So I'm a child of Holocaust survivors. 
Holocaust survivors. My mother and father were in, uh, they, they survived. My mother didn't uh, survive long. She slipped to only 51. My father went to Russia. My mother lost her husband. My father lost his wife. They remarried uh, in a DP camp. They were in Ulm, Tronstein, Landsborg, uh, Fredenwald for a short period of time. My brother was born in, uh, in a DP in, uh, uh, Vasaburg. My other brother was born on the run uh, after my mother was at Auschwitz. So, uh, I, I have a father who's uh, survived the war by running to Russia, like, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of others. And they met up in the DP, they came to America, they spent seven years there. Um, so I'm assuming, that you was, heard, I, I'm assuming that you heard Yiddish at home, if they were survived. They didn't hear English at home, that's for sure. Nobody spoke English. My mother where did, and father. Where did, come, where did you go to school? I went to PS 156 <laughs> on Sutter Avenue between Pitkin and Sutter. And uh, that's a, I'm a Bronzeville boy. Nice. And I played my first pool at the uh, Blue Moon Pool Room on the East 98th Street in Sutter Avenue. And we had two Jaime's delicatessens, not one on Sutter Avenue. So it goes back. And um, I had a big, I was always a big jazz fan. So my segue from college and graduate school at City University in Penn State uh, comes back and then I fall in love with Yiddish theater and I'm in Los Angeles and I come back to do a show for the folks being there called the By Tata Mama Tish, the Stuttgart play. Uh, uh, Yossi Sokolsky dropped out and they asked me to fly back in and I go on without a single rehearsal because wow. that's the way Tsipora Spiesman threw people into shows. And uh, it was uh, a very interesting experience. It was wonderful. And my background is I played and uh, music and singing, but uh, I worked 17 years in uh, nightclubs and jazz clubs, and I'm a big jazz fan. And when I found out there was jazz and Yiddish and music like that, I was sold. So Eli Bass was a, a godsend to me. Right. Songs like uh, the Umgluck Blues and uh, Number Four Humantash Lane, and um, I've been translating songs like from cabaret to Yiddish, and songs that uh, Alan Menken have written to Yiddish. Uh, and for me, it's uh, it's been great. My work has now transferred over to the Hebrew Actors Foundation, which is a beautiful old building, and Alan is the vice president, Rickman. Uh, and we are working toward raising the money of creating two theaters there, possibly just one, two, and a, and a museum, and um, open to everyone. Hi, I would suggest that you put that uh, link into the chat box, and if you can't figure that out, then you'll send it to us, and we'll put, send it out to You're everyone. You're guaranteed I can't figure it out. Mishka <laughs> Shaila. <laughs> but thank you so much, Okay, Ashen and Dan. I want to go over now to our second guest, Michael Wex, who's the author of three books on Yiddish, including the best-selling Born to Kvetch. He has taught the language at the University of Toronto and the University of Michigan. His most recent book, Rhapsody in Schmaltz, did for Yiddish food what Born to Kvetch did for Yiddish speech. His latest major work, Beim Kabarett to Yiddish, an all Yiddish cabaret, premiered at the 2019 edition of the annual Yiddish Summer Festival in Weimar, Weimar, Germany. And over the years, I have personally learned a lot from Michael's lectures at Kleskamp and other Jewish festivals. So I'm very curious to see what tidbits he's going to share with us today. Michael? Oh, thanks, Rochel. Uh, um, if you ask me about Yiddish humor, I would say Yiddish contains a great deal of humor all by itself. That is, you don't need to construct jokes with a narrative or anything. Uh, you can just look sometimes at what's going on underneath the surface of the language itself, and you will see that there's a joke there. So somebody asks you how you're doing, and you're not doing particularly well, which is the default state among for any Yiddish speaker, or they wouldn't be speaking Yiddish. Uh, why just say I'm not doing so well, when you can say ich liege in drei Backbagel? I'm lying in the ground baking bagels. Now, why it has to be dafka bagels that you're baking as distinct from anything other, uh, any other baked good that doesn't cost very much, this I couldn't tell you. But Ligen in Yiddish, Ligen in to lie in the ground, 
it can mean to be dead, but it can also mean that things might not perhaps be going quite so well as you might have wished that they would. So it's like you run into somebody you know on the street, assuming you live somewhere where you're allowed to go out, and you say to him, hello, Moisha, how's business? And he says, hey, the business is in Dreyard. This is sit shiva for the business. It's the business of blessed memory already. You can tell somebody to go in Dreyard. It's not very nice, but people do it all the time. It's a Yiddish way of telling somebody to drop dead or to go to hell. But in this expression, in Ligon and Dreyard and Bach and Bagel, it clearly refers to where it is that you happen to find yourself. And it's as if being dead isn't already bad enough. You've got to spend all of eternity in hellishly hot bakery conditions because the SOBs who had the chitzpah to drop dead before you got all the air conditioned spaces in heaven. Baking bagels that being dead you have no need to eat. That being dead, you have nobody to whom you can sell them. That being dead, you don't even know anybody except for other dead people who are all busy baking their own lousy bagels that they can't get rid of either. This is the Yiddish myth of Sisyphus. Except that Sisyphus, it, Sisyphus is a mythological goal. He's a mythological Gentile. He pushes the rock, the rock rolls back. He pushes the rock, the rock rolls back. Sisyphus at least comes out with muscles. The Jew drops dead and kriegt sach noch akile. He falls dead and gets nothing but another hernia. This, to me, is Yiddish humor. This, this is the essence of the language. Uh, well said. Well said. Thank you. Thank you. So, Michael, you're you're the only Canadian here. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, um, I want to know: Did you grow up speaking Yiddish, and uh, what uh, was your education like? Because you sound kind of yeshiva to yourself. Uh, yeah, I come from Lethbridge, Alberta, which if you're not from Canada, you might never have heard of. It's about 140 miles south of Calgary, uh, 40 minutes from the Montana border. So if you needed a tent for a minion, you went to Montana. It was that kind of a place. But my family was very, very from. Uh, they were from Poland. And we spoke, we spoke nothing at Yiddish, but Yiddish at home. Uh, I went to shul every day of my life for I don't know how long. I think I might still be doing it. Uh, but of course, at the time when I was a kid, shuls in general, an Orthodox shul, especially during the week, ran entirely in Yiddish. Uh, eventually, I've, I went to public schools in Alberta, but eventually uh, I went to institutions of Jewish learning and education uh, farther east, most of which pay me not to mention that I was ever a Talmud there. Uh, but I, I have like a yeshiva, you know, massive to yeshiva education uh, up through that. I went to near Yisrael in Toronto, among other places. Uh, but basically at home, Yiddish was, was what you spoke. It wasn't, not in a Yiddishist ideological sense, the ideology was, you know, a Jew talks Yiddish, and that's it. Uh, it. It didn't get any more complicated than that. Very interesting. So you had Yiddish-speaking peers? Did you have kids? Did you not, speak Yiddish to your friends? Uh, not very many. There were other kids from Yiddish-speaking homes, either because their parents were into Yiddish, or more, more commonly because their parents had come to, to Canada after the Holocaust, where Yiddish was simply the language that they were most comfortable in. But most of the time, uh, I'm talking about in Alberta especially, if we were speaking Yiddish to each other, it's because there was somebody nearby, somebody within earshot that we didn't want to understand what we were saying. I went to some of the schools I went to enforced a you must speak Yiddish 
while you were on the grounds of this school that you actually live in a dormitory of. Uh, you had to speak Yiddish all the time there. So there was some of that. Uh, but in general, like there, there were not, there was not a large number of other children uh, running around uh, with whom I would like play tag in Yiddish or something. Thank you. Sure. Okay, third guest is Shane Baker, who is known as the best loved Gentile on the Yiddish stage today. He has appeared both off Broadway and internationally as Vladimir in his own Yiddish translation of Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot and toured with his one man show, The Big Buckus, A Complete Gentile's Guide to Yiddish Vaudeville. He also serves as director of the Congress for Jewish Culture a Yiddishist organization based in New York. Shane has asked to hold a brief word before we go any further. Shane? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Boyas und Meidlach, Lokshun und Knedlach. A herzlichen Dank euch. Balshoi spasibo. Mil gracias, amigos. Jenkuya barzo. Konya mina san gakono kaijo unu kaitadait kotao totimo kanshashite oremasu. I cannot tell you how pleased I am that the Yiddish Forbets is honoring me tonight with the Young Yiddish Comic of the Year Award, better known as the Why, Why, Why. When Saruchel called me to prepare a table in the presence of mine enemies, yes, I felt like I had fallen into a ditch full of rendered chicken fat. Let me be up front. I am not to the manner born. So it wasn't at all clear. <laughs> you have to do it. <laughs> Let me. Yeah, like that. Let me be up front. I am not to the manner born. So it wasn't at all clear that I would one day rise to the very top of Yiddish comedy in New York City. Gosh, when I was a kid. I was an acolyte in St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in Kansas City. Anyone from St. Andrew's out there this afternoon? Anyone? them <laughs> But I remember even then as I'd walk down the aisle carrying the crucifix or wash the priest's hands before we ate God, I would daydream about Yiddish comedy. Yes, I knew that one day I'd be moving on up to the east side and finally get my piece of pachal. <laughs> uh, like I say, coming from... Coming from Kansas City and being named Shane Bertram Baker, you might well ask, how does a fellow like me wind up in the crazy mixed up business of Yiddish comedy? I can't tell you how many times I've asked myself that question. Or more properly, I can't tell you how many times my mother has asked myself that question. I date it back to 1974 when my father took me to see the newly re-released Marx Brothers movie, Animal Crackers. I heard my first Yiddish word when Groucho sang, did someone call me Schnorrer? And everybody laughed. So I nudged my father and asked, what's a Schnorrer? Being a good Gentile from Kansas City, he gave the only answer he could give. It's nonsense, it doesn't mean anything. It's a made up word. So I went to the other guy I always went to when I had a troubling question, the priest at St. Andrews. And I asked him, Reverend Bacon, what's a Schnorrer? He said the same thing, doesn't mean anything. I said, are you sure about that, Reverend? And he said, you know, Shane, Anyway, that's a little bit about my beginnings in Yiddish comedy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Shane. From what I understand, you first came to comedy, but <laughs> you uh, first met uh, some of the Yiddish, uh, the classic Yiddish actors and actresses, and they were the ones who really encouraged you to come into the Yiddish stage. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, sure. I think my uh, 
first uh, genuine Yiddish experience was seeing Mirla Efros at the uh, Volksbühne Theater back when Sapoira Schweizmann was still running it. And uh, that's when I fell in love with my first Yiddish actress. She was 95, I was 25, Mina Byrne. It was, was strictly a physical relationship. She liked to see how much herring she could stuff into me uh, before I changed her light bulbs. That's not on Urban Dictionary anywhere. Uh, and uh, later, while I was studying with your father, Zechreina Levrocha, Mord Cheshechter, at the Evil Summer Program, uh, I ran into, by accident, Lyuba Kadison, uh, uh, one of the great stars of the Yiddish stage. Uh, maybe her husband is better remembered today, uh, Joe Buloff, but uh, uh, between these two Vilda Litvichkes, uh, that's... Uh, where I got any fluency or competence in Yiddish, I would say, along with some very fine teachers like Schechter and uh, others. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's really interesting. And now I turn to our couple of the year, Alan Lewis Rickman and Yelena Schmulinson. Alan Lewis Rickman is an actor, director, writer, and translator with extensive credits in both English and Yiddish, including Relatively Speaking on Broadway, The Coen Brothers, A Serious Man, a recurring role on Boardwalk Empire, co-adapting and directing the Yiddish Pirates of Penzance, his Shalom Aleichem show, Tevye Served Raw, Garnished with Jews, and regional theater work from Vermont to California. And I'm also going to introduce Yelena, because I would like them to uh, perform something together before I talk to them individually. Yelena Schmulinson, a co-creator and star of Tevye Served Raw, is a singer and actress known for her work on Also a Serious Man, The Good Shepherd, Romeo and Juliet in Yiddish, and she also appeared several times in Orange is the New Black. So before I speak to both of you individually, Show us what you know, some sample of Yiddish humor. Yeah, we're going to do a little, uh, this is a Michael Rosenberg piece uh, about uh, an immigrant who's uh, fond of cantorial singing. I, I don't think I need to say any more than that, uh, but we're doing it for a very special reason. And that reason is we've done it before and we didn't have to learn anything new. So it goes like this. America is nothing but a great big nuthouse. Listen, I love a good chazen, love. So when I hear there's a new chazen in the Bronx, chazen yankel, I jump on the subway and I run up to hear him. Mele, the train is gepack, gepack, gepack. The train is packed, but at 161st Street, everybody starts pushing and shoving. So this is where Chazen Yankel Davins. I look up, this is it. Yankel Stadium! Ich gehe ja rund der Lines mit Lines mit Vara Toina, jeden von dem Volk hin. Pack am Merigan vor Brass, kommt da gute Chasen, geht mit dem Herr. I go downstairs, look at all these Jews. Okay, America might be in that house, but give them a good Chasen, people turn out. Ich nur, ich komme zu zum Box, aber der Mann dort gibt mir eine Frage, was ihr wollt? Grandstand, sie blinches. At the box office, the guy says, what do you want? Grandstand or blinches? Blinches, wir haben blinches, wo der Weg geben dem Tag mit dem Armen, so geht. So for the blinces, I give you both my parents. So I say, give, give me, me blinces. Ich komm mal rein, da sehe ich etwas, ein Riesenplatz mit tausenden Menschen in mitten auf Feld, in den beiden Seiten Lächer, in uh, Trenches. I go inside, there are thousands of people around some kind of a field, and on both sides there's trenches and holes. Für den Loch kommt da, wo ich etwas am Arm mit der Bräunung zu, mit der Modene Jamek auf dem Kopf. Und das ist aber der Quaierlied. Ah, from one hole comes a guy wearing a brown suit and a funny yarmulke. This must be the choir leader. Noch im noch a chevre man mit wollene Socken, kurze Gatkis, in mit a sweater, and auf dem Schwetter steht umgeschrieben Jankel. Und wo soll sein, mein Chasen? Hey, Lenu, wen stellt man sich da, wenn er? Next comes a guy with woolen socks, long underpants, and a sweater with Jankel written on it. Also, this is the Chasen. Okay, 
okay, fine. Start the services already. Met haar moedevillige bezet zijn plaats als de rechter link valt me eronder. Suddenly I feel a zet in my back that could knock a lung out. Pff, hallo, Bobby! Bobby. Ik heb haar koek. Ze hebben zijn man met een zelbige zwet. En er is mij gelijk mee gaven met een atta, boy. Pff, hij zwet meer finster in de egen. I turn around, I see a guy with the same sweater. And then right away it's attaboy. Pff, and I'm seeing stars almost. Zo geer. So I say, wat is het hier? Zo geer. So he says, brother, it's, it's gonna, gonna be some game. Zo geer. So I say, here's the man with the brown and so dark with the yarmulke. Who's the bozo in the brown suit and the yarmulke? Zo geer. So he says, this, this is, is the umpire. Zo geer. So I say, uh, and there, there, with 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 the swollen hand, was took them glove. And the guy with the glove on his big swollen hand. So there. So he says, this, this is, is the pitcher. No, come Walter, who is another man with a matraz of a boyer, and with a strainer of a pole, but so he says it looks. Next comes out some clown with a mattress on his stomach and a spaghetti strainer on his face. So there. So he says, this, this is, is the catcher. catcher. The was catcher. His catching is already cold. Catcher, smatcher, let him catch a cold. The pitcher spikes the glove, right? Then balls with a ball, and he's with a ball. Then pitcher to catcher, then catcher to the pitcher rubs the ball. They start throwing it back and forth from pitcher to catcher, from catcher to pitcher. Nobody wants to hold on to the damn thing. Mit der Mol kommt der Reis, habe ich einen großen Wagen letzt mit der langen Walgeholz. Und er muss sich an einen Zwischen sehen. Und wie auf Zerlach ist, was der dem Catcher nicht catchen dem Bull. Next comes some character with a big uh, rolling pin, shoves himself in between them, and he won't let the catcher catch the ball. And the umpire screams. And the umpire screams. Ball one, ball two, ball three. Mit der Mul geht er geschrei. All of a sudden he hollers, Strike! Tracht ich, wo sind wir? Wo ist ein Union Meeting? What is this here, a Union Meeting? Wo muss ich sitzen, sei alle? Ich weiß nicht, es ist bei mir ein Schab. Mir geht er geschrei, Strike! Gehen alle picketen. I know, by me, in, in the shop, if everybody, uh, somebody yells, Strike! Everybody goes to picket. Ich bin doch aber ein guter Union Mann, stell euch so gut. Mir geht er geschrei, Sit down! Tracht ich, ich schicke Sit down, Strike! Setz euch so gut weg. I'm a good union man, so I stand up. Somebody yells, sit down. Oh, this is a sit down strike. Okay, I sit down. Winter, we have a bath and I spit in bowl. We pitch it some ketchup and catch it some pitch and do, do, miss the grand, de, 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 valgo, de, 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 vagalets and valgo holes. The pitcher and catcher go back to throwing the ball from pitcher to catcher, from catcher to pitcher, and the Mr. Rolling Pin shoves himself right in the middle. And as he gets a zet, then ball, and the ball then fleeing, and then, 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 like, I say, the army shrugging. And he hits the ball, and the ball is flying. And he starts running like a mental case. And then my body net me setting in the plates. And my body behind me starts pounding me on the back again. At the boy, at the boy, and the ball flies and three heavy like life and happen the ball. The ball is flying and three characters are chasing it. So I say, there's an and they. Who are they? So there. So he says, they are the fly catchers. Oh, the hatayra job. Three long and vague letters stones are written with two cotton flings. Can't say the same again. Happen. Some job, three big goofballs running around chasing fly. What's the matter? They can't go to work. And air, air, mit dem Walgeholz. Er stopp nit leif. Und doch was leif der? Er mit sie jagt dir. Mr. Rolling Pin will not stop running. What is somebody chasing him? And the ball flies and swears to tumble with a gewalt. And my body sets me in the plates. And the ball is flying and everybody's hollering and my body keeps pounding me on the back. At the boy, at the boy, run home, run home, run home. So books are getting sitzen. As my soul more. Run home? What am I waiting for? For him to beat my lungs up? The hell with this! I run home. Doctor, I should have came here to Chaz in America. So I'm supposed to go here to Chaz in America? Ah, crank! No way, Jose! I'm, I'm pulling. That's all. And goodbye. That's great. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, talk to Elaine. I'm going out for a beer. Uh, so, so for Michael, who's a Canadian, he probably didn't get all the baseball terms here. <laughs> Hey, I, I grew up on those records, please. <laughs> Michael Rosenberg is still my hero. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and listen, but the whole thing is that Yankee Stadium, Yankee Stadium is in the Bronx. That's like, what, a mile and a half from Canada? So, <laughs> so Alan, why don't you tell us where did you grow up and what school did you attend as a child? Okay, I grew up in Far Rockaway, and I'm not allowed to tell you what school I attended because the school has begged me not to tell anybody. I stole that from Gracie Allen. Uh, I, I went to High Lie. He went to Long Island in Far Rockaway. What is High Lie? What? What is High Lie? What, what was High Lie? It's no longer, but it's a modern Orthodox yeshiva. There's a place called Haftar over in Lawrence yeah. that is uh, 
highlight and another local yeshiva merge to form Haftar. So I understand that um, your father was a katsif, right? Was he a butcher? My father was a katsif, yes, and he was a survivor. My mother was an Amir Kanichka. And I always say, I know I'm a genuine New Yorker because my parents met on the subway. Wow. Can you yeah, tell us about me. that? What's that? Tell us about that. How did that happen? Uh, it was my father had just come here. It was 1949. And he saw an attractive Americhke sitting there on the subway. And he started talking to her. And you know, In what language? Mistama of Yiddish. Almost certainly Yiddish. Uh, because... Um, First of all, Simon had been the first language for both of them. My father's English was never fantastic. Uh, and I can just imagine how, you know, schwach it would have been when he had just gotten here then after the war. So it was, it was likely Yiddish. And you heard Yiddish at home? Oh, yes. My folks spoke Yiddish uh, quite a lot. They did not speak it to me, but at the same time, they didn't use it for secrets either. It was just the, uh, like I say, it was the first language for both of them. Uh, my mom was a child of immigrants. And... They just naturally fell into it. And I liked the sound of it very much. And I would, you know, always, when I was a kid, I would say, how do you say this? What does that mean? Yada, yada. And little by little, I picked it up. I think part of the attraction for me also was because I went to a modern Orthodox yeshiva where we learned nothing but Hebrew, but very, very dull. Hebrew, you know, modern can, spoken Hebrew, I do not find a very interesting language. I, I, I don't. Uh, it, 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 it just doesn't have the, the, the zaft of Yiddish. It doesn't have the, the, the juice, the life of Yiddish. So by comparison with that, the Yiddish particularly sounded just more fun and interesting. So I, I developed a, an interest in it. By the way, in Yeshiva, I learned one, the only Yiddish I heard in 12 years of Yeshiva was one curse, which my 10th grade Gemara Rebbe told us. Still the best Yiddish curse I've ever heard, which is, Zos de leben pinpia hengleich, de hongen by tongen brennen by nacht which for the non-Yiddish speakers means, may you live like a chandelier, hang all day and burn all night. <laughs> I, should also, I also should also tell you before I give you over to the far better half, um, that Yelena made me promise to tell you my first spoken, the first time I remember speaking any Yiddish. Um, and it, this is not exactly something I'm very proud of concerning all the 18 million things I've done with the language since then. But I believe the first time I ever said anything in Yiddish was in shul, where I was sitting next to my friend Avi, a monster, who, when he was not busy throwing M80s at squirrels and things like that, was doing probably things even worse. And uh, anyhow, our, both of our fathers and Avi's uncle, who was near us, and several of the other guys sitting around the school were all were all older immigrant guys. Oh, yeah. And you know, I was about six years old at the time. Avi had overheard, I guess, his father or his uncle or his grandmother saying this, picked it up and taught it to me. And in shul, we are both saying quite loudly, where everybody's davening, we're saying in a, in a, in a, in a broad Polish accent, which means I'm constipated, for those of you who don't understand Yiddish. That's the first Yiddish I ever spoke. Was there a reaction? Was, uh, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> gunplay? I honestly don't, I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> 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 a I camera for those who have not put up yet is a hernia. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Sorry, Elena, I'm at Akana, yeah. you come from much further away than Canada. You're from the former Soviet Union. Yep. So how did you discover Yiddish? Uh, by accident. Um, so I was born in Belarus. I grew up in Ukraine. My family immigrated here in the 90s. I got an acting degree in college um and then i decided i was looking through backstage and there was a notice for the yiddish theater and i auditioned and i didn't get it and then somebody told me about the summer yiddish program at columbia which was at Col the evo program that was at columbia at the time and i had a free summer and nothing to do and it seemed like a good idea at the time and uh i learned it and that's sort of how it all started and then we met the next year no we met that at the very end of that year that i learned yiddish okay. and uh that was that how did you meet? We met, um, I was working on the show that Alan was in. Which in, show was that? Uh, Yoshki Muzikant. Oh, I remember that, yeah. So, yeah. So, so, yeah. Yeah, so that was, and then, and so then I started working at the theater, and so with every new play, 
and we also, I also have some, had somebody to talk to and we used to lie on the couch and read the hard copy dictionary because it seemed like fun. Right here. <laughs> so yeah. So, we were big Yiddish dorks. It's just so that, yeah. My, my favorite pastime is reading Niborski's Hebrew language diction, Hebrew words in Yiddish, Lush and Kloy book on the subway when I was allowed to go on the subway. <laughs> it's so, it's such, yeah, so I guess that's a nerdy's uh, love, loving it. <laughs> clearly, clearly. So I want to open up a question. There it is. Thank you, Chaim. Uh, it's really a treasure of Yiddish words that come from Lashon Kodesh, which means the holy tongue from Hebrew. Not only how it was used in, by stu when studying Gomorrah, the Talmud, but also how secular Jews adapted it for modern terms. So it's, it's a really fascinating book to read. Um, I'd like to open up the question to you. I mean, we've had this whole session on Yiddish humor. I especially did not want to call it Jewish humor. Um, and I wanted to know if you see a distinction uh, between Jewish and Yiddish humor. And just anyone uh, have an opinion on it? Jewish humor is humor that is in English, not Yiddish. Thanks. Does that help? Thanks a lot. Yeah, that's one way of putting it. I, I'm trying to help. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that you do need to know some Yiddish or have a fam familiarity with Yiddish language or with culture in order to appreciate Yiddish humor. And you guys make it easier because you do use English in the performance as well. So people who don't know Yiddish can catch on. So they get the, the distinctly Eastern European Jewish flavor, uh, the irony, uh, and, and yet they also get the English the translation so that they can keep up. Uh, is, I, I, I'll one say, of my experiences um, in, in Jewish and Yiddish humor is when I'm performing and I translate as I go everything, I don't rely on subtitles. So everything is exactly scripted out. So the experience I've had is as I deliver the Yiddish punchline first, um, you get a laugh, but you've got a full audience and maybe you've got 25% or 35% that will understand it. You then get the second laugh. If you've translated it precisely, you get the same people who laughed in Yiddish laughing in English, and it sort of goes around and around. So they're very closely tied in that they work. It's, it's the delivery. I if tell what to call back later. <laughs> I, I, I'll take uh, something I was about to say to uh, expand on a little bit of, of what I was saying is that the truth is it's the mentality that's in common. The real difference is the language. Jewish humor is 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 humor that reflects a, a, a mentality that's that that's common to Eastern European Jews, which is the the, the probably the dominant uh, uh, influence in American humor of starting with the second half of the 20th century. Or earlier than that, even I should I, I should say, you know I could I could think of a hundred jokes I could tell you that are English that were written in English, but that are completely without they don't have a word of Yiddish in it, but that are completely Yiddish. A very 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 obvious, very simple example. Everybody knows this joke. Uh, Eddie Murphy does it in the uh, in the post credit sequence of um, coming, to coming to America when he's dressed up as the, as the old Jewish guy. You know, waiter, taste that soup. Any hands? Anybody not know that joke out there in, in yeah, Zoom tell, land? You know the joke. Tell the joke. All right. All right. Guy sits in the deli, orders a bowl of soup. The waiter brings it over. A minute later, calls the waiter, orders Veda. Taste that soup. It's, it, it's What's the matter? It's not hot enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Ratner's not, soup. It's, I, I didn't say Ratner's. <laughs> anyway, it's, Veda, taste that soup. It's too hot? Not a problem. Let me bring it back to the kitchen. I'll get you a cool bowl of soup. Give me a second. No, no, Veda. Taste that soup. It's cold. No problem. Don't worry. Just I'll give you. I'll get a. I'll get a hot bowl of soup. Give me a second of it. Beta. Taste that soup. You don't like it? It's all right. I'll give you something else. I'll scratch it off the bill. It's not as beta. Taste that soup. It's all right. All right. I'll taste it. Where's the spoon? Ah. Uh, uh, I understood uh, that. No. Then you finish with aha. Aha, uh -huh, because that's a very Yiddish expression. Only, only the Litvaks say aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't uh -huh. talk to anybody who said aha uh -huh if they told that joke. <laughs> but the, this that's ends with a question. Rule. That's that's uh -huh. that's even more <laughs> Jewish. A, uh, a question. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I, I I take it from the Rav Amachshir over here. If he says, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, to me, Yiddish humor also has that that Talmudic inflection very often. It does, uh, which, but. 
somebody like Seinfeld who didn't go to Jewish day school and didn't study Talmud, I'm assuming, maybe I shouldn't assume. Um, I can't see him doing that kind of thing with a Yiddish kind of accent. So to me, no, because he doesn't yeah. speak the language. Eddie Cantor did that kind of thing in English. And he, right, he that was, was years ago. But yeah, but he was no different. yeshiva boy. I mean, you're talking, what's the difference between Jewish, you know, general Jewish and Yiddish? And I think most, what Al, as Alan said, most of what we think of as North American Jewish humor, even North American general humor, is a development to a large degree from Yiddish. And again, once you, re, you know, you can recontextualize things. You know, my favorite like that is the, the kid who kills his mother and father and then has to go to court, throws himself on the court's mercy because he's a poor orphan. <laughs> uh, since the late 60s, everybody has thought this was a Jewish story. This actually originated with Artemis Ward, the mid-19th century American humorist. Uh, who, I don't know, made it up, published it, and Abraham Lincoln thought it was funny. Really? Oh, no, you know, Lincoln thinks it's funny. Yeah. Uh, and Lincoln referred to it on a number of occasions. Uh -huh. How do we know Artemis Ward was not Avraham Waldbaum? I checked. I like it. I checked. I mean, he gefragt my mail, uh, <laughs> nothing. There is I, no I, record. Excuse me, and a guy named A.B. with a big nose and a beard liked it. <laughs> Hello? Okay. But wait a minute. Abe Lincoln was tall. There are no tall Jews. <laughs> there, there you have. <laughs> tall Jews. Tall like that. My brother. Yeah. I mean, when but, I listen to, G but, to Jackie Mason, Jackie there are no Mason tall Jews? very Yiddish to me. There's yeah, two, but Jackie Mason was so Yiddish <laughs> that he was too Yiddish, according to Oh, you know. sorry, Chaim. I forgot. Yeah, you're, you're pretty tall. <laughs> Alanga Six Lox. To the rest Three. of them. Uh, Alanga Lox. Six for three, Alanga Lux, as I be shane it is Yeah, but the exception proves the rule. I have a Six for three. I'm about, uh, about Jackie Mason, <laughs> that even though Jackie Mason does it all in English, his inflection is so Yiddish and his, his irony and his like, take my wife, please kind of jokes. Mm -hmm. So I do feel like I'm listening to Yiddish humor. Well, he's also, I've, I've heard recordings of Jackie Mason getting mad off stage. And he does not have that accent when he's mad oh, off stage, you know. Not at all. Jackie, Mason comes, Jackie Mason comes from Sheboygan. Nobody and talks like this in Sheboygan. I don't care <laughs> how from you are. Eventually, you got to go outside. Yeah, wait a minute. Uh, Wait, wait a second, wait a second. I did Fiddler on the Roof with Jackie Mason in uh -huh. 1978. Yeah. Who did you With, play? Who did you play? I played the innkeeper, Mordche, the oh. innkeeper, and I was Jackie's shadow. And uh, who was in it but um, Karen Ziemba, who's won a couple of Tonys, and it was directed by Joe Latito. We played in Brooklyn, we played in Florida. Jackie did not have uh, that kind of a, um, uh accent uh, when he was doing it, but he thought he could do Fiddler with that accent and um, the director kind of toned him down. So he, but he also was, you know, mostly from New Jersey. He may have been born in Sheboygan, yeah. but he grew up mostly in Jersey is what he said. More importantly, so, I think Sheboygan- yeah, well, he went, Didn't he go to Teferis Yisrael to Moshe Fein? Wasn't he thrown out of Teferis Yisrael? Oh, yeah, was no of Moshe Einstein's. Uh, I, is, it, are we sure that Sheboygan is not a Yiddish word? I have it should be a Yiddish word. It sounds like Elmboygen, which means elbow. Elmboygen. Yeah. So they're right next to each other. It's like inside <laughs> of the Elmboygen. It's the Sheboygen. Sheboygen. Mm -hmm. Mention my name. <laughs> Mention. Yes, right. Right. <laughs> next question. Yes. Okay, so I also wanted to know, what is it that you see for the future of Yiddish humor? I mean, today's young people, although that I have to say, I'm surprised to see how many millennials are studying Yiddish today. Uh, but they are a new generation that did not grow up with our immigrant homes, with the, that, that irony, that inflection. Um, so what do you see as the future uh, of Yiddish humor? What kind of audiences can we expect? Maybe Hasidim who you know, went off the derach, I'm just That's six people a year. There you go. You know, that'll keep us all eating. 
<laughs> you know, so, so much of the old stuff is based on the idea of something is out of place. You know, like all the Michael Rosenberg routines, like the one that Alan and Yelena just did. You know, it's based on somebody who has no clue what goes on in the society around them. And that being out of place thing is, if you look backwards, it's so much a feature of Yiddish and I think even general Jewish humor. Uh, I, skits about Jews having to join the army are among the oldest things surviving in like Yiddish uh, theatrical records. And there were Gentile versions of exactly the same thing, uh, the Jew in the army. These, you know, it was all based on you're in the wrong place or you, you don't understand the rules. Yeah. Uh, that's less and less so, you know, you got people that are learning Yiddish, and, you know, that's great. But they tend to be people who, except for the fact that they are Jewish, and insofar as that takes you outside of mainstream, uh, the mainstream community, but are otherwise perfectly well adjusted, perfectly at home in American, let's say, uh, or Israeli or Canadian culture. Uh, I think how it will develop is difficult. So you're saying, difficult will, will they get the jokes if they are not, they don't feel like outsiders themselves? No, but will they make the jokes? Eventually, they're going to have to stop stealing from us and do something. You know, I, it's I, time I, showing. Uh, my, my greater worry is, and, is, whether, is whether, when you say, whether they'll get the jokes, my greater worry about that next generation is whether they'll get any jokes. Ah. Exactly. Uh, Why, you don't think that they have a sense and, of humor? No, no, do lick the hint by the open. That's what the yeah, and there. yes, and oh. yeah, traditional Yiddish humor is based a great deal on things that would be highly incorrect in any other line. I, I have a bit of a different take in, in that what I came to humor, and I don't consider myself a comedian, though I, I went on in Los Angeles at the comedy store in 1990s early and, and tried it, but it wasn't my forte. And, but what I, I know what came to me was I saw what I understood. I did have the language. And, but when I discovered Michael Rosenberg and doing his Chazen uh, thing on YouTube and, uh, and some people had told me about him as well and read about him, it, it, it really did strike home with me. When I see today's generation, it hasn't jumped over one. They're, they're taking what you have and wanting that material. They're wanting to learn from it. They're wanting to do it. And a lot of people come asking me for material and saying, I'd like to have that song in my repertoire. And it's tough because I remember somebody going to Pesach Fishman, all of a shalom. And uh, they said- a very popular Yiddish teacher. Thank teacher. You. And he would have wonderful little routines. But what he said to them is when they wanted his material, he said, there's a, there's a world of material out there. There's all these books back here. You can learn it and do it. And they are a little lazy, and I think that goes in hand with Alan is saying, that do they have the humor? Do they have what it takes to do it? Yes, they do. Will they? Don't click the hint. It's because I still feel positive that they will. I don't know how much effort they have and time to put in, but they want to perform. They want to do it, um, and some of them want a shortcut. And every one of these panelists right here, Shane, Yelena, Alan, everybody here uh, will tell you uh, that there are no shortcuts. And Michael, are there any? No. You, you, you develop what you do. I'm still looking for Carnegie Hall. I don't know. <laughs> there you go. I swear so, to somebody once walked to me in the train, up, walked up to me in the train station. No, uh, come seven, on. I swear to God. And said to me, how do I get to Carnegie Hall? <laughs> and I had to strangle myself not to do the punchline. Sorry about, sorry for the. Uh, uh, but there's, I just see, I'm looking at the chat box and I see uh, somebody just asked, why is it that Jews tend to be such a, a high percentage of comedians are Jewish, proportionate to other groups? Um, what do you attribute that to? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, besides Shane, I Shane think we should ask Shane. Shane's ever talking, talking, 
goy, but the rest, of, generally, the ones who are doing humor, very high percentage of them are Jewish. So I'm just curious if you have any uh, thoughts on that. I do. Including from you, Shane. Please, Shane, because I'm talking to him. But uh, one, one, so thoughts, no. This is, this is something <laughs> that occurred to me years ago, because I'm, I'm very much interested in, in the history of comedy and just in, in general. And something we always associate Jews with comedy. But you look at the great silent comedies, which are some of the most, the most eternal and universal and some of the greatest comedy has ever made. None of the great silent comedians were Jews. Not Who are you one talking of, about? Who? Chaplin, Keaton, yeah. Harold Lloyd, Laurel and Hardy, the, the figures that anybody in the world can understand and it will be understood 150, 200, 1,000 years from now will be as funny as they are today. Not a one of them is Jews, are Jews. I, I heard W.C. Field that's a Megayag event. He did not convert. Yeah. And, oh, so Harry uh, Lott or I, you know. And, but, and, but Jews are wildly overrepresented in dialogue comedy, not in comedy in general. Ah, general. yes, so not in slapstick. You're talking not, about slapstick. Not, sla not slapstick, that's the wrong oh, word, but physical, physical, visual comedy about the world we live in. They're not comedy about the physical environment that we live in. They're not, they, they, the Jews are not involved with very few exceptions. And they're minor. Uh, uh, that, that's not a Jewish thing. The Jewish stuff is always about, like the jokes, it's always about a way of thinking, a perspective, a disjuncture, like Michael was saying, not belonging in a place. But, and I would suggest that comes from my personal belief. It's also specifically Ashkenazi, not Jewish in general. Uh, and I think it really comes from basically 2,000 years in Dank Yeshiva's learning Talmud, because, because that was the height of the culture for all that time, because What's Talmud? It's a series of arguments, debates, questioning, questioning, reasoning, thinking, teaching out, darshaning, interpreting. That's where the humor comes from because the humor works the same way. Where's the spoon? Ah, and 18 million other things. But that's my, that's my personal theory is why so much verbal humor is so disproportionately Jewish is because of that being, having worked itself into the DNA for two millennia. That's interesting. In other words, Jews are a very talky people. I mean, we're the ones who created psychoanalysis. Uh, that was a Jewish man, you know. In other words, that's the way we express it. Yekas. Yekas. So he was a yekka, but he was still Jewish. <laughs> I, I have a, just a brief observation on what Alan's saying. It, it sort of goes along. My father uh, spoke very little Yiddish, came here in the 50s, uh, and was in a DP the, the whole time. But when he got here, he watched all the physical comedies that Alan's described. Uh, you know, Lucy was his idol. Uh, he didn't have to understand the language. Lucy? Lucy, yeah, the I Love Lucy show, and Abbott and Costello, and W.C. Fields, and all the old, uh, all those that there was physical comedy to be understood. It was somewhat slapstick, but it was something that was always done with great intelligence. So there, uh, he didn't get the, the the comedy from the from the word he got it there. So today, if you if you jump that generation to today's generation, will they today's generation get the slapstick comedy, or are they too serious? Going back to what Alan is saying before, so has it jumped a generation? Because that was his explanation of Nazism, that uh, you you had it uh, during the war and then you didn't. Then he says it was like a, a grain of. Uh, uh, corn that didn't grow one year, but it, grain, it grew the following year. So does it jump over? And do we young generations today appreciate what we grew up seeing and what my father, because he couldn't understand English, grew up seeing? What will tomorrow's generation really focus in on? I have no clue. Well, I do, I do know a number of millennials who have studied Yiddish, are studying Yiddish, and I do find a change in the way they think and in the way they speak when they start speaking in Yiddish. They start picking up the nuance. They start, and they want to, they want to get it. So um, I'm actually much more optimistic um, about, about the millennials who are studying Yiddish and we're very happy to, uh, to teach them all that we know. And I just want to thank you all for coming. This has been such a delight. Uh, we should all continue laughing during these very trying times. And, um, and I hope that you've all, uh, Everybody out there in uh, Yiddish land, I hope you all enjoyed our talk today and our performances, and I wish you all Zeit Gesund. Zeit Gesund. Yeah, it's all. Yes, you did. Yeah.